Welcome and thank you all for coming tonight. As you probably know, the title of tonight's debate is Without God, Can There Be an Objective Ethics? And I, before we get started, I just wanted to take a moment to clarify what this debate is and is not about. So oftentimes, when issues of morality and ethics are debated or discussed, the question is whether ethics is subjective, meaning it depends on people's beliefs or opinions, or objective, meaning it is independent of those things. However, both speakers tonight are not debating that question. They agree that there can be objective ethics. However, the question they are debating tonight is whether or not that, that can be the case without God. So keep that in mind as you listen to tonight's debate. Here's a little bit about how the debate's going to go. So each speaker will give a 20-minute opening statement. After that, there will be a round of 12-minute responses from each speaker, and then another round of 8-minute responses. Finally, each speaker will wrap up with a five-minute closing statement. After that, we're going to go into a period of audience question and answer, but we're going to take questions from you guys. Now, let me introduce you to our two speakers. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jim Sturba. Dr. Sturba teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in ethics and political philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. He has published 38 books and over 200 articles. And he is past president of the American Philosophical Association Central Division, the North American Society for Social Philosophy, and Concerned Philosophers for Peace. In 2013, he received a grant from the John Templeton Foundation to bring the yet untapped resources of ethics to bear on the problem of evil. In 2019, he published Is a Good God Logically Possible with Paul Gray McMillan, a paperback edition. And tomorrow, Oxford University Press will publish a debate book, also a paperback edition, that he did with Richard Swinburne on the topic, Could a Good God Permit So Much Suffering? Please welcome Dr. Sherman. Second, we have Dr. Adam Johnson. Dr. Johnson earned his PhD in philosophy of religion at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. He has taught for the Rhineland School of Theology in Wolverson, Germany, for Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City, Missouri, and serves as a senior research fellow at the Center for the Foundations of Ethics at Houston Christian University. He is the president and founder of Convincing Proof, a ministry that provides good reasons and evidence to trust in Christ. He is the author, editor, or contributor to several published works, including A Debate on God and Morality, What is the Best Account of Objective Moral Values and Duties, co-authored with William Lane Craig, J.P. Moreland, Eric Wielenberg, and others. His most recent book, Divine Love Theory, How the Trinity is the Source and Foundation of Morality, was published in March 2023 by Craigle Academic. You can learn more about Adam and his work at www.convincingproof.org. Please welcome Adam Johnson. So without further ado, since Dr. Sturba is taking the affirmative position and answering yes to the question, without God, can there be an objective ethics, he will go first. And I'll now hand it over to Dr. Sturba for his opening speech. I'm very pleased to be here. My thanks to Rocio Christie for sponsoring this debate and Adam Johnson for organizing it. Without the existence of the all good, all powerful God of traditional theism, can there be an objective ethics? My answer to this question has two steps. First, I will argue that the existence of the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the evil in the world. This establishes that the God of traditional theism does not in fact exist in our world. Second, I will argue that there is an objective ethics accessible to us in our world, even with the proven absence of the God of traditional theism. So what is my argument that the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the evil in the world? My argument begins by noting that all the goods that God could provide to us are either goods to which we have a right or goods to which we don't have a right. Each of these types can be further divided into goods that are logically dependent on God's permission of horrendous evil consequences and goods that are not logically dependent on God's permission of horrendous evil consequences. This gives us a fourfold classification of all the goods with which God could provide to us. 
I then set out three necessary moral requirements that apply to all the goods that God could provide to us. These requirements are exceptionless, minimal components of the polling principle, never to do evil that good may come of it, that would be acceptable to consequentialists and non-consequentialists alike. These requirements would be acceptable to consequentialists and non-consequentialists because as minimal components of the polling principle have been formulated, there are no good consequentialists or non-consequentialist reasons for violating them. Theists and atheists should also accept these requirements for the same reasons that consequentialists and non-consequentialists accept them. Here are the requirements. Moral evil prevention requirement A. Prevent horrendous evil consequences when you can easily do so without violating anyone's rights and no other goods at stake, are at stake. Now what is there not to like about this requirement? Surely it is an exceptionless, necessary moral requirement. The next requirement is moral evil prevention requirement B. Don't secure a good using morally objectionable means when you could easily secure the same good by using morally unobjectionable means. Again, what is there not to like about this requirement? Is it not an exceptionless, necessary moral requirement just like verb A? The last requirement is moral evil prevention requirement C. Do not permit rather than prevent the infliction of especially horrendous evil consequences of immoral action on their would-be victims in order to provide would-be beneficiaries with goods they would morally prefer not to have. Now, without the infliction of horrendous evil consequences on their victims, the would-be beneficiaries of such consequences could still enjoy the opportunity to be friends with God, the resources for a decent life, an equal liberty for soul making, and all the other goods God could provide that are not logically dependent on his permission of horrendous evil consequences. Moreover, the would-be beneficiaries don't need and can easily do without those goods that are logically dependent on God's permission of, of those horrendous evil consequences. And lastly, the infliction of such horrendous evil consequences is also irreparable because there are no goods that God could otherwise provide that would adequately make up for God's not preventing those horrendous evil consequences in the first place. It follows that God should have acted to respect the moral preferences of the would-be beneficiaries not to receive such goods. Even the perpetrators of such wrongful deeds who later utilize the opportunity to repent and seek forgiveness would always morally prefer that God had prevented the horrendous evil consequences of their immoral actions, especially given the irreparable harm such consequences inflict on their victims. So in virtue of moral evil prevention requirement C, God should have acted to respect the moral preferences of all the would-be beneficiaries of the horrendous evil consequences of immoral actions and prevented the infliction of those consequences on their victims. Is MERV C then not on a par with MERV A and B, and as such an exceptionless necessary moral requirement? In the case of MERV C, Preventing the horrendous evil consequences does not provide the only good that is, that is at stake for the would-be beneficiaries, as in the case of MERV A. Nor is it the case for MERV C that the would-be beneficiaries could get whatever good is at issue without permitting horrendous evil consequences, as holds for MERV B. Rather, for C, the goods that would-be beneficiaries could receive if God were to prevent the horrendous evil consequences at issue, are not just in, are, are just incomparably greater than the goods that they could receive if God permitted those horrendous evil consequences. And this holds especially for those on whom the horrendous evil consequences would have been irreparably inflicted if God had permitted them. Hence, there is no way the moral requirement for mercy could be any stronger. In sum, all the goods that God could, the goods that could be provided to us are either goods to which we have a right or goods to which we don't have a right. Each of these types further divides into first order goods that do not logically depend on moral wrongdoing 
and second order goods that do logically depend on moral wrongdoing. With respect then to first order goods to which we have a right and first order goods to which we do not have a right, moral evil prevention requirement A and B respectively, respectively morally constrain the pursuit of greater good justifications for both God and ourselves. And with respect to second order goods to which we have a right and second order goods to which we also uh, we also, uh, to goods which we do not have a right, according to Merv, moral evil prevention requirement C, the prefer preferences of would-be beneficiaries of those goods conclusively morally require that God prevent the first order evil consequences on which the very existence of those second order goods depend. Still, it might be objected that if God were to start acting as preventer of last resort, of the horrendous evil consequences, good people would no longer have the motivation to prevent such consequences themselves. Now, I've elsewhere argued that when we choose to intervene to prevent especially horrendous evil consequences or immoral action, either we'll be completely successful or preventing those consequences and preventing those consequences, or our intervention will fall short. When the latter is going to happen, I claim. God should do something to make the prevention completely successful. Likewise, when we choose not to intervene to prevent her, such consequences, I claim God again should intervene, but not in the way, that, the way that is fully successful. Here, there is a residue of evil consequences that the victim still does suffer. This residue is not a horrendous evil, but it is a significant one, and it is something for which we are primarily responsible. We could have prevented those consequences, but we chose not to do so, and that makes us responsible for them. Of course, God too could have prevented those harmful consequences from happening, even if we don't. It's just that in such cases, God should choose not to intervene so as to, co as, so as to completely prevent both the significant as well as the horrendous evil consequences of wrongful actions in order to leave us with an ample opportunity for soul making. I argue that if God were to prevent just the horrendous evil consequences of such actions in this way, it would clearly make the world much, much better than the world we currently inhabit. And it definitely would not turn the world into a moral kindergarten, since we would be able to prevent both the significant and the horrendous consequences of immoral actions, sometimes with God's help, and when we choose to do so, and when we choose not to do so, we would be responsible for the significant evil consequences of those actions, which we're imagining God would choose not to prevent in such cases in order to give us ample opportunity for soul making. Instead of being in a moral kindergarten, it would be a world that morally good people would prefer to inhabit. It would just not be our world where which in which the horrendous evil consequences of immoral actions abound, consequences that an all-good, all-powerful God of traditional theism, if he existed, would not have prevented, permitted. We can restate my argument to approximate the form that John Mackey should have used in, uh, in, to succeed in his famous exchange with Alvin Plantinga as follows. One, there is an all-good, all-powerful God. This is assumed for the sake of argument by both Mackey and Plantinga. Two, if there is an all-good, all-powerful God, then necessarily he would be adhering to moral evil prevention requirements A through C. Three, if God were adhering to moral evil prevention requirements A through C, then necessarily especially horrendous evil consequence of immoral action would not be obtaining through what would have to be his permission. Four, horrendous evil consequences of immoral actions obtain all around us, which if God exists, would have to be through his permission. This is assumed by both Mackey and Plantinga. Five, therefore it's not the case that there is an all good, all powerful God, which, is, which contradicts one. How then do I propose to show that an object of ethics accessible to us in our world, given the pr proven ex absence of the God of traditional theism in our world. Let me begin with our natural abilities. Frequently enough, we find ourselves having to decide whether to act one way rather than another. 
And frequently enough, we find ourselves weighing our own interests against the interests of others when deciding what to do. So why not understand moral requirements to be based on an appropriate weighing of our own interests and the interests of others? Surely atheists, as well as theists, could know what is in their own self-interest, as well as what is in the interest of others. Of course, these determinations would have to be made simply on the basis of what we could know about ourselves and others independently of any theological beliefs that we may or may not happen to have. Such an appropriate weighing of competing interests of ourselves and others should then enable us to understand that murder and stealing are morally wrong, and more generally, that the pursuit of our own self-interest must sometimes be constrained for the sake of the interests of others, especially when doing so avoids inflicting serious harm on others. We also, need, we also need to go further and take the most basic norm of morality to be to treat all relevant interests appropriately, that is, fairly, and then understand all other moral norms to be derivable from this one most basic norm. Morality, then, would be the standard by which everyone's relevant interests are treated fairly. Moral requirements would then hold of any being who is capable of fairly assessing the relevant interests of others and acting upon the, that assessment. So understood, moral requirements would clearly be accessible to theists and atheists alike. Now I've claimed that the most basic moral requirement for theists and atheists is to treat all relevant interests fairly. And can't the supremacy of this norm be challenged, both from a self-interested and from an altruistic perspective. Thus imagine an egoist claiming that what we ought to do is always to do what best serves our own self-interest, and a pure altruist claiming that what we ought to do is always do what serves the interests of others. Obviously, the most, most basic moral requirement of morality that I propose attempts to go in between these two perspectives. But is there any good argument for doing so? Now, good arguments are by definition non-question begging. That is, they do not assume what they are trying to prove. So the question the issue here is which perspective should, take, should each of us take as supreme? And obviously the question would be begged if we assume for the, from the start that we should either take the egoistic or the altruistic perspective as supreme. Suppose then we were to ideally rank our true egoistic interests from the high, highest ranking, highest ranking to the lowest ranking, while at the same time ranking our altruistic, uh, true altruistic interests from the highest ranking to the lowest ranking. We would then face two kinds of cases, cases in which there is a conflict between our relevant egoistic and altruistic interests, and cases in which there is no conflict. In cases, in the, it seems obvious that where there's no conflict and both interests are conclusive reasons of their kind, both interests should be acted upon. In such contexts, we should do what is favored both by our egoistic and altruistic interests. Now, when we rationally assess the relevant interests in conflict cases, three solutions are possible. One, egoistic interests always have priority over conflicting altruistic interests. Two, altruistic interests always have priority over conflicting egoistic interests. Three, some kind of compromise is rationally required. In this compromise, sometimes egoistic interests have priority over altruistic interests, and sometimes altruistic interests ha would have priority over egoistic interests. Once the conflict is described in this manner, the third solution can be seen to be the one that is rationally required. This is because the first and second solutions give exclusive priority to one class of interests over the other, and only a question-begging justification can be given for such an exclusive priority. Only by employing the third solution, sometimes giving priority to egoistic interests and sometimes giving priority to altruistic interests, can we avoid a question-begging resolution. 
Notice, too, that this standard of rationality will not support just any compromise between the relevant egoistic and altruistic interests. The compromise must be a non-arbitrary one, for otherwise it would beg the question uh, with respect to the opposing egoistic or altruistic perspectives. Such a compromise would have to respect the rankings of both egoistic and altruistic interests imposed by the egoistic and altruistic perspectives respectively. Accordingly, any non-arbitrary compromise among such interests in seeking not to beg the question against either egoism or altruism would have to give priority in the, to, to those interests that rank highest in each category. Failure to give priority to highest ranking egoistic or altruistic interests would, other things being equal, be contrary to reason. Now, to view morality as a compromise, uh, of the com non-question-begging compromise between egoistic and altruistic interests is also to view morality as fairly taking into account those same interests. This is because the standard of non-question-beggingness -begging, that is required of good arguments is the same standard of fairness that morality applies to all relevant interests. In this way, the fairness of morality, uh, in this way, the fairness that morality requires of us when we are dealing with conflicts between ourselves and others reflects and is justified by the fairness that is required of us in argumentation. Thus, this means that the most basic norm of morality, treat all relevant interests fairly, is further justified by the non-question-begging requirement of good argumentation. In this way, the basic norm of morality is shown to be rationally preferable both to egoistic and altruistic perspectives. Now, a fair assessment of the relevant interests can be done in a number of ways. For example, one could employ a Rawlsian veil of ignorance with parties in the original position, re representing all relevant interests. This would result in each person having a right to the resources and opportunities for a decent life. Of course, there may be some variation with respect to what is to count as a fair evaluation of all relevant interests, but it should not be that different if every effort is being made to carry out that evaluation in a non-question-begging way. In sum, we have seen theists have wanted to argue that ethics is ultimately grounded in God's, God's commands or in his nature. And I have shown that if the existence of the God of traditional theism is logically compatible with all the evil in the world, hence the commands and nature of a non-existent God cannot be the, the, the grounds for the moral requirements we recognize. Rather, I have shown that ethics can be justified by appealing to the basic norm of morality, which is to treat all relevant interests fairly, and that in turn, that in turn can be justified by appeal to a non-question-begging requirement of good argumentation. All right, now imagine that you're hiking up a mountain with a friend, and you discover what looks like the sculpture of a horse. After looking it over, you suggest that it's an ancient sculpture which intelligent minds, humans, designed out of the rock. But your friend disagrees. She thinks it's a boulder that just happens to look like a horse. So you have a debate, both giving reasons to think your theory is the better explanation. Well, there's a similar debate going on between atheists and theists. Here in this reality we find ourselves in, we've discovered some interesting things. For example, we exist in this intricate universe that began sometime in the finite past. Since this universe has many features which seem designed and fine-tuned, theists have argued that the best explanation is that it came from some sort of intelligent mind they call God. Many say this fine-tuning argument is the strongest argument for the existence of God. Atheists, of course, argue that God isn't the best explanation for the universe and propose other theories. 
Now, another interesting thing that we've discovered here in reality is moral truth. Here are at least four aspects to moral truth that we've discovered. First, we've discovered that some actions are morally good, like building an orphanage. Some actions are bad, like murder and rape. But what makes some actions good and others bad? Second, we've discovered that humans have moral obligations. Certain things that we ought to do and other things that we shouldn't. But where do these authoritative oughts come from? Third, humans have moral worth. Every person is special and should be treated respectfully. But why are humans more special than other forms of life, such as thorn bushes? Fourth, humans have moral rights, such as the right to life and various freedoms. But how do we have these rights and other forms of life, say cows, don't? Now, some claim that these moral statements aren't objectively real, but are just your subjective beliefs similar to your favorite flavor of ice cream. Your favorite ice cream is subjective because it depends only on your thinking. If you change your mind about your favorite flavor, then your favorite, changes, favorite flavor changes because it's based only on how you think. There's no objectively right or wrong flavor of ice cream. It's subjective and therefore relative. My favorite's chocolate, yours might be vanilla. Moral subjectivists claim that our moral beliefs are like this. On the other hand, moral realists, like myself, argue that there's more to morality than just our own ideas, that there are objectively real, fixed moral truths that are true independent of what we think. They're like mathematical truths and that they're fixed independent from us. They can't be changed even if our beliefs about them change and we discover them. We don't create them. Now here's a good thought experiment to figure out if something is subjective or objectively real. Imagine there's a mad scientist and he gave us all pills so that something gross like pistachio ice cream was our favorite. Now would that make pistachio ice cream our favorite? Yes, it would, because our favorite ice cream is determined only by how we think. It's subjective. But let's say that mad scientist gave us all pills so that we thought something like 2 plus 2 equals 5. Would that make 2 plus 2 equals 5? Well, no, it wouldn't, because that is a truth that is objectively real and fixed independent of how we think. So here's the key question we're talking about tonight when it comes to morality. Is morality determined subjectively by how we think, like our favorite ice cream? Or is it objectively real, like 2 plus 2 equals 4? So if that same mad scientist gave us pills so we all believed, for instance, rape was morally good, would that make rape be morally good? No, it wouldn't. Rape would still be wrong and evil even if none of us believed that it was because that moral truth is objectively fixed independent of what we think about it. Now, the vast majority of people agree that morality is objectively real, but that's not enough. In order to justify this position, we need to provide a good explanation for how it can be objectively real. And that's what this debate is about. Who has the best explanation for how morality can be objectively true? Nearly all theists agree that God is the best explanation for objective morality, but they disagree, even among theists, about how this works. So I've put together a theory. My explanation for this is called divine love theory. And tonight I'm going to argue that my theory is a better explanation for this objective moral truth than Jim's theory. So first, my theory of what makes an action morally good was influenced by a Christian philosopher, Robert Adams. 
He's been a professor at Yale and Oxford, among other schools. And Adams argues that God is the ultimate fixed standard of moral goodness. Therefore, if a a human action is morally good when it resembles God. My theory is similar, but I propose that ultimate moral goodness is the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity. God is one being, but three persons, Father, Son, and Spirit. And the love between these divine persons is the perfect moral standard of goodness, a fixed, unchanging measuring stick, if you will, by which our actions can be measured to see if they're good or not. It's morally good, for example, to build an orphanage because that resembles the ultimate fixed standard of goodness, the love within the Trinity. But, for instance, if I tell hurtful lies about someone, that's morally bad because it doesn't resemble the love within the Trinity. Second, my explanation for moral obligations, why we ought to do good things, begins by noting that God created us, human beings, to extend the loving relationships, the loving fellowship of the Trinity. So our moral obligations originate from this purpose God created us for, to enjoy loving relationships with Him and then with each other. Our obligations are generated when God makes us aware of what's good and bad and that we should do what's good. Now God makes us aware of this indirectly through our conscience and directly through His commands, God's commands. But it's important to note that God's commands are merely instructions on how to best achieve the purpose that we're created for, to love God and to love others. So we should follow God's instructions, his commands, because of our loving relationship with him. Obeying God is one of the ways we express our love for him. In that sense, the basis of our obligations is our relationship with God, very similar to like a parent-child relationship. Third, my theory explains why every man, woman, and child has moral worth, because we're created in God's image to resemble him in enjoying loving relationships. Fourth, my theory explains moral rights. I think our country's founding fathers were correct that we're all endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And these rights flow from being created in God's image to enjoy loving relationships. Now, there are many atheists who argue that only God could provide a foundation for objective morality. And since they don't believe that there's a God, they conclude that morality isn't objectively real. For example, probably most famously, Friedrich Nietzsche ridiculed those who thought Morality could survive when the God who sanctions it is missing. But there are other atheists, like Jim, for instance, who have tried to develop explanations for how morality could be objective even if there is no God. Now, one of the reasons why Jim believes God isn't the best explanation for objective morality is because he's convinced, because of the problem of evil, that there is no God. However, as I'm going to argue tonight, evil doesn't prove that there's no God, only that we might not know why God allows evil. Now, many reasons have been proposed for why God allows evil, and here's one that I've developed, one possibility that I call divine love theodicy. Now, sometimes we think God could have created any possible universe or any possible timeline that we can imagine. If God is all-powerful, surely he could have created a universe almost just like this one, but with a little bit less suffering, right? Maybe not. It might be the case that God imposed constraints on himself, which then limited the types of universes he could choose to create. For example, he may have decided to create humans with free will and then constrain himself from forcing them to do what he wants because that would violate their free will. Well, why would God impose this sort of constraint on himself? The reason is 
free will is required to experience the greatest good, that is, loving relationships with God and with others. Love simply requires free will. If God forced us to love, that wouldn't be real love. We would just be puppets doing what God forced us to do. Nobody wants to be in a relationship with someone who's forced to love them, but with someone who chooses to. So if this was actually the case, then God faced these three options. Option one, create nothing. Option two, create a universe with human puppets that look like they're enjoying loving relationships, but really God is pulling their strings, forcing them to do these things, and thus there wouldn't be true love. Or option three, create a universe with humans who have free will so that there'd be true loving relationships, knowing that some, possibly all of them, would sometimes use their freedom to do evil, which of course can cause terrible suffering. Now it seems reasonable to me that God would choose the third option, even though he knew it involved some evil and suffering because he also knew there'd be real loving relationships, the value, which, the value of which would outweigh the suffering. Now, of course, within this third option, there'd be many different ways that God could have the circumstances play out. Think of all the possible timelines, if you will. Though the number of possible ways God could orchestrate the circumstances would be limited because, remember, he constrains himself from violating people's free will. But still, couldn't God orchestrate the circumstances to minimize the suffering people caused by their evil choices? Well, maybe that's exactly what God did. Maybe out of all the possible ways of how things could play out, within option three, God chose this set of circumstances we're experiencing because this one had the least amount of suffering. It might be the case that if he prevented any specific suffering in this universe or timeline, that'd somehow lead to worse suffering later on. Or it might be the case that if God removed the horrendous consequences of our evil choices, then overall we'd choose to do even more evil. Or maybe minimizing suffering wasn't God's only goal. It might be the case that God had another goal to maximize the greatest good, that is, loving relationships with him and with others. And if that's true, then after evaluating every possible path for how the universe could play out, God chose the one that maximizes the quality and quantity of loving relationships for a given amount of suffering. That might be the universe we're living in. We could be experiencing the greatest possible universe, the one that maximizes loving relationships for a given amount of suffering. Now, we might be thinking that God could lower the amount of suffering just a little bit while keeping the quality and quantity of loving relationships the same. But that's really impossible for us to know given our finite knowledge. We just can't fathom all the ripple effects either in this life or the next life, that would come from adjusting various circumstances. It might not be the case that the quality or quantity of loving relationships are directly logically dependent upon evil and suffering, but it's reasonable to think that changing the circumstances to adjust the amount of suffering could have ripple effects that eventually affect the overall quantity or quality of loving relationships. Now, we might also think that the benefit of increasing loving relationships just isn't worth the cost of the extra suffering that might be entailed. But again, as finite beings, it's extremely difficult for us to do that sort of trade-off calculation. We tend to overestimate the cost of suffering, especially when we're in the midst of it. But if God is all-knowing, then he would know exactly how to calculate the best trade-off and how to maximize the quantity and quality of loving relationships for a given amount of suffering. Now, note, I'm not 
claiming this is exactly what happened. I'm just proposing it as a possibility. Like many people, I've I've experienced suffering myself, and I've wondered why God would allow this pain in my life and why he wouldn't rescue me from it. There have been times where I felt that God just didn't care or might not even exist. But when my emotions settle down and I consider the situation more calmly, I conclude there are at least two good reasons that the problem of evil should not lead us to think that there is no God. First, there's just so many good reasons to believe that there is a God, like the fine-tuning argument, the first cause argument. And second, even if we don't know exactly why God allows evil and suffering, there are several possible reasonable explanations for why he does. Now, as for Jim's moral theory, he said that ethics can be justified by appealing to the most basic moral norm of fairness, treating everyone's interests fairly. And then all other moral norms can be derived from this one most basic moral norm. Fairness, then, in turn, can be justified by appealing to rational principles. That's why he titled his book, from rationality to equality. Since fairness and equality can be uh, calculated objectively, Jim thinks then he's shown morality can be objective even if there's no God. But is this theory the best explanation of objective morality? I'm going to argue tonight that Jim's theory is not a plausible explanation because it doesn't adequately explain the four aspects of morality we've discovered. So first, he hasn't really given us a good convincing explanation of what makes something morally good. For instance, what makes building an orphanage a good thing to do? G.E. Moore's open question dilemma helps explain why Jim's theory of moral goodness is unsuccessful. Now, Moore, one of the founders of analytic philosophy, said that people commit a naturalistic fallacy when they try to define moral goodness by identifying it with the property, such as the avoidance of harm or some rational principle in this case. Whatever property someone claims is identical with moral goodness, it will always be an open question whether that property itself is morally good. If someone claims moral goodness is, for instance, not harming others, the open question becomes, well, why is not harming others morally good? Now, Jim tonight claimed that fairness is morally good because it accords with rational principles. But why is accordance with rationality morally good? He hasn't given us good reasons to accept that major assumption at the foundation of his theory. Now, Moore argued the only way to avoid this open question dilemma is to conclude, as he did, that moral goodness is a separate, non-reductive property. Another philosopher, Thomas Aquinas, argued similarly that moral goodness that each good thing is not its goodness. I'm sorry, let me say it again. He wrote, each good thing that is not its goodness is good by participation. But that which is good by participation has something prior to it from which it receives goodness. And this can't proceed to infinity. We must therefore reach some first good that is not by participation good, but is good through its own essence. And this, of course, he concluded is God. So the conversation would go like this. Why is building an orphanage morally good? Jim would say it's morally good because that's fair. But why is being fair morally good? Jim might say being fair is morally good because it's rational. But why is being rational morally good? Now, to avoid this going on forever and ever, there must be something ultimate that just is the good itself. When the question is asked, well, why is that thing good? The answer is similar to the end of the first cause argument for God, because it just is. There's nothing before it that caused it, 
And there's nothing behind it that makes it good. It just is the good. To avoid an infinite series, every moral theory, mine, Jim's, everyone's, eventually has to propose an ultimate good that just is goodness itself. Now, Jim proposed that rationality is the ultimate good, whereas I'm proposing tonight that God is this ultimate good. So the key question is which proposed ultimate good is the better, more plausible explanation for objective morality? Second, Jim hasn't given us a convincing explanation of where our moral obligations come from. Why should we do good things? Now, he said that moral requirements would apply to any being who's capable of fairly assessing the interests of others and acting on them. But why are we obligated to be fair or rational? If there's no God, then I think atheist scientist Jacques Mano was correct that man at last knows he is alone in the unfeeling immensity of the universe out of which he emerged only by chance. His destiny is nowhere spelled out, nor is his moral duty. Third, Jim hasn't explained why humans have moral worth. If there's no God, then there's really nothing special about human beings. Of course, we think we're special, but again, that's subjective. If there's no God, then I think atheist Bertrand Russell was correct, that man is simply the product of causes which had no provision of the end they were achieving. His origin, his growth, his hopes, his fears, loves, beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms. Lastly, fourth, Jim hasn't explained where our moral rights come from. If there's no God, then I think atheist Friedrich Nietzsche was correct. That moral rights were invented by weak people to try to make strong people feel guilty for oppressing them. Thank you very much. Adam begins his first talk with a brief consideration of design and fine-tuning arguments for the existence of God. He doesn't seem to realize that even if these arguments were successful, which I don't think they are, all they would show in light of my argument from evil is that although the universe has a designer, fine-tuner, that designer, fine-tuner, cannot be the all-good, all-powerful God of traditional theism. This is because my argument shows that such a God is logically incompatible, especially with all the horrendous evil consequences we find all around us in the world. Hence, my argument from evil deprives Adam of just the explainer he wanted to, for the existence of objective morality in our world. Accordingly, you might think that Adam would seek to critique the various working parts of my argument from evil that I devote more than half of my first talk to setting out. But Adam doesn't do this. All that he says directly against my argument is that, quote, evil doesn't prove there's no God, only that we might not know why God allows evil, end of quote. That hardly serves to undermine my argument, which purports to show that certain kinds of evil in the world are logically incompatible with, all the, good, all, with, with the all-good, all-powerful God of traditional theism. So Adam needs to say something about the specifics of my argument. If my argument stands, Adam is deprived of the explainer for objective morality that he wants to employ. Now, Adam does provide what I've called in my book, Is a Good God Logically Possible? What Adam fails to recognize is that my argument from evil does not appeal to an ethics before creation, but rather to an ethics after creation. It's an argument about what God should, should and should not do after he's created us when he no longer faces the same options that he faced before he created us. The difference here is analogous to the morally acceptable options a heterosexual couple would have before they, created, uh, they, uh, they engaged in intercourse, compared to the morally acceptable options they would have after they brought children into the world. After bringing children into the world, they would have particular obligations to nurture and protect their children that they did not have before. 
Something analogous would hold true, I contend, for the God of traditional theism. Adam spends a time speculating on how God might per permit horrendous evil consequences in order to achieve greater goods. Here it would have been helpful for Adam to address my argument from evil, which begins with a fourfold classification of all the goods that God could provide to us. I then show that for each of these classes of goods, there are constraints on the permission or prevention of horrendous evil consequences that the all-good, all-powerful God of traditional theism, if he exists, would be violating. That I contend shows that such a God is logically compatible with all the evil in our world. If that's the case, then Adam would not have the God of traditional theism on which to ground objective morality. Turning to my account of how to ground morality in what I have shown to be a traditionally godless world, let me begin by explaining how we humans come to endorse morality, which I take to be a way of fairly taking into account the relevant interests that are at stake. On my account, we find ourselves frequently enough having to decide to act one way rather than another. And frequently enough, we find that found ourselves weighing our own interests against the interests of others in deciding what to do. Consequently, an appropriate weighing of our own interests and the interests of others became an attractive way of making decisions and acting upon them. Frequently, we would get our others to create to come together and, and act collectively in this way. Accordingly, the strategy for deciding and acting or something very close to it came to be called morality. Morality so understood was also taken to be objective because it was not based on just the interests of any one individual or just the interests of any one group of individuals, but on a fair resolution of the relevant interests, all the relevant interests that are at stake. Now, Adam claims that my understanding of morality as taking all the relevant interest into account fails G.E. Moore's open question argument. But Adam misunderstands Moore's argument. Moore's argument was a way of showing that, uh, that attempts to define more moral or not more normative terms exclusively in non-moral or non-normative terms fail. But that is not what I'm doing here. My definition has normativity on both sides of the definition. So it's not a target for Moore's open question argument. Moore was only challenging defining normative terms non-normatively. That is not what I'm doing. Of course, my account of morality as fairly taking into account all the relevant interests can still be challenged. Historically, the most important challenge, going back at least to Thosimachus in Plato's Republic, has been the why be moral challenge, typically understood as coming from the self-interested or egoistic perspective. Despite its long history, most contemporary moral and political philosophers are still not convinced that morality can meet this challenge. Many think it is rationally justifiable to be moral or to be an egoist, and hence either side can justifiably use force against the other. Aware of this problem, societies have frequently used force to contain e egoist, egoistic behavior of their members with some success. In my work in moral and political philosophy, I've attempted to go further and show that only morality and not egoism can be given a non-question-begging justification. Since the principle of non-question-beggingness that I employ is a principle of rationality not morality. I show that to, uh, what, I, what I claim to have provided is an argument from rationality to morality. And happily, most egoists are not willing to give up on their commitment to the rationality of the principle of non-question beggingness. But suppose someone were to reject the principle of non-question beggingness, the standard of good argumentation. What happens then? If someone were to reject the principle the possibility of employing good arguments to reach agreement with such a person ceases. All that is left for us to do is to employ moral, uh, morally acceptable procedures for containing such rebels to ensure that they do not significantly harm the rest of us. 
That is, as far as we can go with using morality and rationality to justify our decisions and actions toward each other. Let me now answer the questions that Adam raises, both at the beginning and the end of his talk. First, what makes some actions good and others bad? Answer, my answer, moral, morally good actions are good because they fairly take into account all the relevant interests. Morally bad actions are bad because they fail to do this. Two, second, where do moral obligations and rights that correlate with them come from? Answer, they are the result of what would be a fair deliberative procedure where all the relevant interests are represented, something analogous to how obligations and their correlative rights are thought to emerge from John Rawls' original position. Third, how is the worth of humans and the worth of, 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 of other non-human sentient beings and, and sentient and non-sentient living beings to be determined? Answer, here it must be recognized that while all living beings do have a good of their own, what is good for ourselves can conflict with what is good for other non-human living beings, sometimes putting us in a life and death struggle with them. What then happens, when this happens, we should carry out that struggle justly and fairly. For example, we don't need to engage in the cruelties of factory farming in order to provide a healthy diet for ourselves. In my book, From Rationality to Equality, I have worked out in some detail the moral constraints that apply to us who are pr presumably the only moral agents here in our dealings with the non-human, sentient and non-sentient living beings with whom we inhabit the world. Let me end now by drawing attention to the two of the three moral requirements which my argument from evil that I presented at the very first part of, of, of my earlier paper rest. Requirement A, prevent horrendous evil consequences when one can easily do so without violating anyone's rights and no other goods are at stake. What is there not to like about this requirement? Surely it's an exceptionalist necessary moral requirement that applies to all of us, God included. Now consider requirement B. Don't secure a good moral, um, using morally objectionable means when you can just as easily secure the same good by using morally unobjectionable means. Again, what is there not to like about this requirement? Is it not an exceptionalist necessary moral requirement just like requirement A? Now that is just two of the three moral requirements on which my argument from evil rests. If these requirements are self-evident, as I think you should see they are, and the third moral requirement is as well, then, our, then my argument from evil goes through against the existence of the God of traditional theism. Surely then, Adam must pay close attention and address the parts of my argument from evil. Given that, left unchallenged, that argument undermines the basis for his own view. He's not saying, because there's horrendous evil, it's difficult to believe that God exists. I could sympathize with that. No, what he's saying is because there's horrendous evil, it's logically impossible for God to exist. Now this extreme logical problem of evil was popular in the mid-1900s. However, even atheist philosophers came to recognize that it's incredibly difficult to defend such a strong claim. Alvin Plantinga, who was also a philosophy professor at Notre Dame, like Dr. Sturba, pointed out that all one has to do to defeat this logical problem of evil is to provide a possible explanation where both God and evil exist. It doesn't have to be the actual correct explanation. Since the claim is so strong, it's impossible for both God and evil to exist. All that's required to refute the claim is a possible scenario where God and evil both exist. That's why most consider this logical problem of evil to be a dead argument. Atheist philosophy professor William Rowe wrote, 
Some philosophers have contended that the existence of evil is logically inconsistent with the existence of God. No one, I think, has succeeded in establishing such an extravagant claim. So, has Jim successfully resurrected this logical problem of evil? Hardly. Even atheist philosopher Eric Wielenberg wrote that Planica's basic strategy can be used to defeat Sturba's newer logical problem of evil. Wielenberg himself even proposed a possible model where God exists and permits horrendous evils. Wielenberg explained that if this model is logically possible, then the first premise of Sturba's argument is false, thus Sturba's new logical problem of evil succumbs to a modified version of Planiga's old free will defense. So in my first speech, I also proposed a possible explanation for why God allows horrendous evil. Jim said that my explanation fails to deal with ethics after creation. He agrees before creation, God may have had justifiable reasons to create a universe that includes horrendous evil. But after creation, God should step in and stop horrendous evils. However, as I explained, there are possible reasons why God might not do this, might not step into creation and stop horrendous evils. It's possible that if God stopped any specific horrendous evil in this universe, this timeline, that'd somehow lead to even worse evil later on. It might also be the case that if God prevented the horrendous consequences of a particular evil choice, then that would cause us to make even more horrendous evil choices down the road. Or it might be that if God stepped in to present, prevent a specific horrendous evil, somehow that would affect either the quantity or quality of loving relationships. Remember, I propose that God's primary goal is to maximize the greatest good loving relationships with him and with others. So it's possible that changing circumstances, as Jim is asking, to adjust various suffering caused by evil could have ripple effects that would affect the overall quantity or quality of loving relationships. Now, again, we might imagine that God could stop a particular horrendous evil while keeping everything else the same the quality and quantity of loving relationships. But that's really impossible for us to know given our finite knowledge. We just can't fathom all the ripple effects, either in this, this life or the next life. Again, I'm not saying this is the actual situation, merely a possibility. But if my explanation is even logically possible, then Jim's argument fails because it shows that it's not impossible for horrendous evil in God to both exist. Now, as for Jim's explanation of morality, it doesn't seem like he's really engaging in meta-ethics. He's jumping instead straight to a generic moral principle, fairness. But that has to do with the field of ethics, not meta-ethics. Here's the difference. Ethics, what we're mostly familiar with, we have most of our conversations in this area around ethics, but ethics is trying to develop guidelines to make good moral decisions. And I agree that fairness is a useful principle to help us figure out how to make good moral decisions. But meta-ethics goes deeper than ethics and tries to explain ontologically where these moral principles like fairness come from and why we're obligated to follow them. And that's what this debate is about. What's the best explanation for these authoritative, mind-independent moral truths like fairness? Meta-ethics, the field of meta-ethics, also wrestles with whether morality is just our subjective opinion or is real objective truth that we discover, similar to mathematical truths. And if morality is objective, then what's the best explanation for how and why it's objective? Now, Jim said that morality is objective in that it's not based on just the interests of one individual or group, but on the relative 
but on all relevant interests. But in metaethics, that's not the sense of objective that people are discussing. In metaethics, people are trying to explain how moral truths, like fairness, can be authoritative and objectively real in the sense that they're true, independent of what we think. Let me give you some examples. Atheist philosopher Russ Schaefer Landau explained that he defends the theory that moral judgments enjoy a special sort of objectivity. Such judgments, when true, are so independently of what any human being anywhere, in any circumstance, whatever, thinks of them. Similarly, David Enoch, philosopher, described objective morality as the position that there are independent truths, objective ones, that we discover rather than create or construct. A theist philosopher, theistic philosopher, Alvin Plantinga, who we've seen tonight already, wrote that moral truths are objective in the sense that they are independent of human beliefs and desires. It's wrong to torture people, for example, and would remain wrong even if most or all of the world's population came to believe that this behavior is perfectly acceptable. So it's that sense of objectivity that we're discussing in metaethics. These atheist and Christian philosophers propose different theories as to how morality can be objective in this sense, but what I'm arguing tonight is that the theistic explanation is the better explanation. So in my metaethical theory of objective morality, I'm proposing that the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity is the determining factor in what makes something good or bad. If a human action resembles the love between the members of the Trinity, then it's good. And if an action doesn't resemble the love between the members of the Trinity, then it's bad. Now, Jim merely proposed that something is good if it fairly takes into account all the relevant interests and bad if it doesn't. And that's why I brought up Moore's open question dilemma and Aquinas' first good argument. I'm not claiming to use Moore's argument the way that Moore did. No, I'm using Moore's and Aquinas' arguments to make the point that there must be some ultimate good. You just can't stop at a generic principle like fairness because the open question is going to be, well, why is fairness good? Now, maybe Jim is proposing that fairness is the ultimate good, but he hasn't given us any good reasons to think that. Is fairness a plausible candidate for being the ultimate moral good? How could fairness generate authoritative moral oughts that we're obligated to follow? Where does our moral right to be treated fairly come from? Jim needs to go beyond just suggesting a generic ethical guideline and provide a meta-ethical explanation of where these moral truths come from and how they can be objectively true independent of our subjective opinions. If there's no God, as Jim maintains, then fairness, I think the best explanation of fairness in that sense, is merely a subjective idea that humans developed because it was helpful pragmatically. And that's basically what Jim said. He said that over time, humans came to find fairness attractive because it worked in getting people to act collectively. If there's no God, I would say, all of our moral beliefs, including fairness, are just human thoughts that nature selected because they increased our prospects for survival and or reproduction. As the TV show Survivor illustrates, a group that works together well, which does involve aspects such as fairness, reciprocity, cooperation, is better able to outwit, outplay, and outlast a group that doesn't. Similarly, as the story is often told, there was an evolutionary advantage to groups that adopted such principles. Working together well, they could better compete against other groups in the battle for scarce resources. So if there's no God, I would say all of our moral beliefs came about through this random, accidental process of evolution. If our evolutionary path would have played out differently, then our moral beliefs would be radically different. That's why I would argue if there is no God, morality, the best explanation of morality is that it's subjective and arbitrary. Darwin recognized this when he wrote, 
For example, if we humans were reared, brought up under the same conditions as bees, our unmarried females would, like the worker bees, think it a sacred duty to kill their brothers, and mothers would strive to kill their fertile daughters, and no one would think of interfering. So I'm arguing that, there, that if there is no God, what we call love is merely a chemical reaction, a chemical reaction nature selected in our random evolutionary path because, again, it led to greater chances of reproduction. If there's no God, our moral beliefs are random, subjective, and arbitrary. They'd be radically different if our evolution took a different path. Michael Roos, atheist philosophy of science professor at Florida State University, wrote that morality is a biological adaption no less than our hands and feet and teeth. He said, I appreciate that when someone says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they're referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. He also wrote that Darwinian theory shows that morality is a function of subjective feelings, but it also shows that we have the illusion of objectivity. Morality is a collective illusion foisted upon us by our genes. If there's no God, it's hard for me to see how Rus could be wrong. It seems to be if there is no God, it's hard to see how our moral beliefs aren't accidental, arbitrary, subjective human ideas nature selected because in our evolutionary path, they happen to increase our chances of survival and reproduction. Thank you very much. Adam starts off his last presentation making sure everyone understands that I presented an argument that purports to show that all good, all powerful God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the horrendous evil consequences in the world. Here Adam seems to be saying that my argument for, that, for this conclusion is not one to be ignored. Yet ignore it is just what he has done in his first two presentations. Given that Adam has not yet directly challenged the working parts of my argument from evil, he now tries instead to defeat my argument by appealing to authorities, specifically Alvin Plantinga, my longtime colleague at Notre Dame, uh, Eric Wielenberg, who I know fairly well, and lastly, William Rowe, who died in 2015 before I had published anything on the problem of evil. Now, Plantinga had argued that the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible incomp with some moral evil, whereas I have argued, what I've argued is that the God of traditional theism is not logically compatible with all the horrendous evil co consequences in the world. Hence, the conclusions of both our arguments could be true which means that the success of Plantinga's argument has no implication at all for the success of my argument. By contrast, Willenberg, in a special issue of religions that Adam cites, does directly challenge my argument that the God of traditional theism is not logically compatible with all the evil consequences in the world. However, the problem that, that with Willenberg's challenge, as I pointed out in the same special issue that Adam cites, is that Wielenberg does not have my argument in his sights. Hence, Wielenberg may not actually be disagreeing with me once he is clear about what my argument is. Fortunately, I visited Wielenberg's university earlier this month to give a talk, and so I have had the chance to see how things stand when Wielenberg actually has my argument in his sights. Lastly, Lastly, William Rowe died just about the time I began working on the problem of evil, and well before I came up with my God argument. Even so, I've studied Rowe's work carefully, and I've come to believe that, uh, that if Rowe had worked more in moral and political philosophy before turning his attention to the problem of evil, he might too have come up with something like my God logical argument from evil. This is because the problem of evil is primarily a moral problem, and consequently working in moral and political philosophy really does help to believe, I believe, uh, to, in, to coming to terms with it. 
Turning to Adam's discussion of my account of ethics without God, Adams contends that with my focus on fairness, my account remains within ethics and therefore it does not go beyond ethics to provide a meta-ethical account. But I showed in my last presentation that my account does provide a meta-ethical, beyond the ethical, grounds for the ethical standard of fairness in the rational standard of non-question begging, non-question begging argumentation. That I have been able to ground my ethical standard of fairness in a meta-ethical standard of non-question beggingness also provides an answer to the challenge of egoism, an age-old meta-ethical challenge to ethics for which Adams has no solution. Now Adam notes that I say my account is objective and that it is not based on just the interests of one individual or group but on a fair consideration of all relevant interests. But then Adam claims that this, is, that this is not the sense of objective that people are discussing in metaethics. Here Adams brings in three authorities, Schaefer Landau, Enoch, and Panega, to establish the conclusion that an objective morality is discovered rather than made, and that it is independent of what any actual individual or groups, presumably even God, actually takes it to be. But it, that's my view as well. For me, the ultimate truth or, or, or norm of morality, which is to fairly take into account all relevant interests, is a truth or norm that is discovered rather than made and is also independent of what any actual individual or groups actually take it to be. Hence, there appears to be a great deal of common ground here accepts that Adam allows that Schaefer Landau, an atheist, holds to this objective account of morality, but then claims that because I'm an atheist, my standard of fairness has to be a subjective idea. Here I think Adam is just confused. Both Schaefer Landau and myself should be understood to be appealing to the same objective account of morality, which I then further specify in terms of an ideal of fairness. Now, Adam persists in raising challenges that G.E. Moore would have thought could not be meaningfully raised, such as asking me, why is fairness good? To which the only still uninformative response I could give is that being fair is just a fundamental way of being good. However, this inability to provide informative answers arises for Adam's view as well. Consider Adam's preferred account according to which, quote, loving relations, relationships between the members of the Trinity is the determining factor that makes something good, end of quote. Here we could raise the analogous question, why are loving relations good? And here too, we face the same inability to give an informative answer. Yet despite the similarity, there is still a good reason to prefer my fair relations account of morality to Adam's loving relations account, beyond God's impossi impossibility. Loving relations are usually understood to be normative mainly for family and intimate relationships, whereas fairness is understood to provide an appropriate ideal from a much broader array of relationships, and hence is a better general standard uh, for a morality for all of us. Now, in a relatively short period of time, the Earth's environment will become totally inho inhospitable for rational and moral reflective creatures like ourselves, assuming we continue to heat up the Earth as we are presently doing. Then we will go extinct. Likewise, if things had not gone as they did in the past, for example, if an asteroid hitting the Earth had not dr driven dinosaurs to extinction, making the rise of mammals possible, we would probably never have come into existence in the first place. So our presence and our continued existence on Earth is clearly contingent. But I am interested in another what-if question. What if Adam comes to recognize the validity and soundness of my argument from evil whose working parts he has yet to challenge, would he then give up on, the, on, on morality? Would he think that torturing innocent children for the fun of it 
could just be just fine? That is the what if question I would like an answer to. I want to reiterate that I sympathize with people when they say it's difficult to believe in God sometimes when we see so much evil in the world. I felt that way myself. But note that that's not what Jim is saying. Jim's claiming it's logically impossible for God to exist. Now the reason that I haven't walked through all of the detailed working parts of his problem of evil argument is because it's not actually necessary. As Plantinga pointed out so well, when a person claims that something's logically impossible, all that's required to defeat their claim is to provide a possible explanation. And when I quote philosophers like Plantinga, I'm not appealing to authorities, I'm referring to experts who specialize in this subject that have made good points. And this is common practice in all fields, science, history, and philosophy. So if my explanations of how God and horrendous evil can both exist are even just possible, and Jim hasn't shown that they're not, then by definition, it's not impossible for God and horrendous evil to both exist. Now, as for those who struggle to believe in God when you see all the evil in this world, I hear you, I do. I encourage you to carefully consider the explanations I've suggested for why God might allow this evil. And these explanations I've offered do satisfy all of Jim's conditions. Now, I am glad that Jim clarified he believes morality is objective in the sense that we discuss in metaethics, that it's true independently of what anyone thinks. That's the common ground that we agree on among those of us who are moral realists. See, there are theists who are moral realists, like Plantinga and myself, and there are atheists who are moral realists, like Russ Schaefer Landau and Eric Wielenberg. And now that Jim has clarified that he believes morality is objective, we can put him in that category too. But even though all of these moral realists agree that morality is objective, theists and atheists propose different theories to explain how morality can be objectively true. So the question is, who has the better explanation? For example, I had a debate with uh, Eric Wielenberg here at this university a few years ago, and I argued that Wielenberg's atheistic theory of objective morality isn't very plausible. I don't think Schaefer Landau's theory is very plausible either. And now that I've evaluated Jim's theory, I don't think that it is a plausible theory of objective morality either. Now, one of the reasons it's not plausible is, as I've argued, it actually winds up making morality subjective, not objective. I'm not claiming that since Jim's theory is atheistic, it therefore must be subjective. I'm arguing that Jim's theory fails to accomplish what he's trying to do. He's trying to explain how morality can be objective, but his theory fails because it ends up making morality subjective, not objective. Now, it sounds like Jim's starting to understand my point that every moral theory must have an ultimate good. But he's still unclear on this because he said being fair is just a fundamental way of being good. So he hasn't really committed himself yet to the idea that fairness is the ultimate good. He's just saying it's a way of being good. So he needs to define or describe exactly what he thinks the ultimate good is. But let's say that that's what he's proposing. Let's say he's proposing that fairness is the ultimate good. After all, he did say that the ultimate truth of morality is to fairly take into account all relevant interests. If that's what he's claiming, then when we'd ask him, well, why is fairness good? He'd say, well, because Fairness just is the good. There's nothing behind fairness that makes it good. That's just what the good is. And that's reasonable. He's got to have some sort of ultimate good in his theory. All more moral theories do. Otherwise, there's an infinite regress problem. Similarly, I'm proposing that God is the ultimate good. So when someone asks me, well, 
why is God good? I'd say the exact same thing, because God just is the good. There's nothing behind God that makes him good. That's just what the good is. And since God is a trinity of three divine persons in loving relationships with each other, that means loving relationships are included in the good. So when Jim asks, well, why are loving relationships good? I don't have an uninformative answer. My answer is actually exactly the same as Jim's because that just is the good. Every moral theory reaches the same point, that there's some ultimate good. Now that we, and hopefully Jim, understands that every moral theory has to have such an ultimate good, we can consider which proposed ultimate good is the most plausible. Is fairness the more plausible candidate for being the ultimate good? Or is God, specifically a Trinitarian God, a more plausible candidate? Now, don't get me wrong. Fairness is an important aspect of morality. It just doesn't seem like a plausible candidate for being the ultimate good. If there's no God, then where could the idea of fairness have come from except subjectively from ourselves? If there's no God, how could fairness exist objectively on its own apart from, an, from us. Tonight, I've given several reasons to conclude that God is the most plausible candidate for the ultimate good. But in my book, Divine Love Theory, I give many more reasons. Now, to wrap up this talk, for Jim's, as for Jim's question, if I came to believe, let's say hypothetically, that there is no God, would I think that torturing children is morally okay? My answer to that would be no. It's similar to my belief that the universe had a beginning. I believe the universe had a beginning because of solid scientific evidence. And I believe that God is the best explanation for what brought the universe into existence. But let's say for some reason in the future, I came to believe that there is no God I wouldn't reject the fact that the universe had a beginning. Similarly, I strongly believe that torturing children is evil. I think everybody does. And I believe that God is the best explanation for why this is evil. But if for some reason, someday in the future, I came to believe that there is no God, I wouldn't reject the fact that torturing children is evil. Now caveat, if there is no God, I think it's very difficult to explain why anything is good or evil. I'd have to look for some non-theistic explanation for objective morality. The theory that God created the universe is so much more convincing than any atheistic theories that try to explain the universe. And similarly, the theory that God is the source of morality is so much more convincing to me than any atheistic theories that try to explain objective morality. Thank you very much. In all three of his contributions to this debate, Adam has failed to discuss the working parts of my argument that the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the horrendous evil consequences in our world. Despite my repeated requests that he do so, and despite the fact that if my logical argument from evil succeeds, Adam's attempt to ground morality on God would, have, would be totally undermined. In his latest contribution, Adam attempts citing Planiga to justify his omission by just providing, quote, a possible explanation of where both God and evil exists, end of quote. But as Planiga knew, in his own time, he could not provide such an explanation unless he defeated Mackey's argument that the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the evil in the world. Hence, Planiga attempted and succeeded in showing against Mackey that the God of traditional theism is logically compatible with some evil occurring in our world. Yeah, while Planiga was successful against Mackey, his argument does not work against my own logical argument from evil, 
which maintains that the God of traditional theism is logically incompatible with all the horrendous evil consequences in our world. That requires a different argument to refute. Hence, if Adam had followed Plantinga's lead, as he seems always to want to do, he would have provided a critique of the working parts of my God argument, which, however, he has yet failed to do. So what is my argument that Adam has failed to critique? It begins by noting that all the goods that God could provide to us are either goods to which we have a right or goods to which we do not have a right. Each of these types can be further divided into goods that are logically dependent on God's permission of horrendous evil consequences and goods that are not logically dependent on God's permission of horrendous evil consequences. This gives us a fourfold classification of all the goods with which God could provide us. Would Adam deny that we can make this fourfold classification? I don't think so. I then set out three necessary requirements that taken together apply to all the goods that God could provide to us. These requirements are exceptionless minimal components of the Pauline principle, which would be acceptable to consequentialists and non-consequentialists alike. The first requirement is requirement A, prevent horrendous evil consequences when one could easily do so without violating anyone's rights and no other goods are at stake. What is there not to like about this requirement? Surely Adam should have to admit that this is an exceptionless, necessary moral requirement that applies to all of us, God included. Now consider requirement B. Don't secure good using a morally objectionable means when you can easily secure the same good by using morally unobjectionable means. Again, what is there not to like about this requirement? Wouldn't Adam have to admit that is an exceptionless, necessary moral requirement, just like requirement A. Now, that is just two of the three moral requirements, there's only three, on which my argument from evil rests. If these two requirements are self-evident, as I think you should see that they are, and the third moral requirement is as well, then my argument from evil goes through against the existence of the God of traditional theism. Surely then, Adam must, like Plantinga did for Mackey, directly address the parts of my argument from evil. Given that left unchallenged, that argument completely undermines his God-based justification of morality. I go on in my presentations to provide a justification for an objective morality without God that is grounded in a standard of fairly taking into account all relevant interests and a rational ideal of non-question bakingness. By contrast, Adam presents a God-based justification for morality that he's actually not entitled to defend, while acknowledging that if he came to believe there was no God, possibly by carefully examining my argument, he would still endorse an objective ethics, maybe one, I might add, not that dissimilar from my own. So in my last speech here, I want to clarify I'm not saying that Plantinga's argument uh, defeats Jim's problem of evil. I'm saying Plantinga's strategy defeats Jim's problem of evil. As I noted, atheist philosopher Eric Wielenberg agreed when he wrote Plantinga's basic strategy can be used to defeat Sturba's newer logical argument from evil. Plantinga pointed out when a person claims something is impossible, all that's required to refute the claim is a possible explanation. If something's at least possible, then, by definition, it's not impossible. That's why tonight I've provided a possible, and I would say reasonable, explanation for why God allows horrendous evil. And I've addressed the working parts of Jim's argument in the sense that my explanation satisfies his three moral requirements. Now, as we conclude this debate, let me summarize my position. As humans, we've discovered some interesting things here in this reality we find ourselves in. We've discovered we exist in this intricate, fine-tuned universe that began sometime in the finite past. We've also discovered objective moral truth. Some actions are good, others are bad. We've discovered authoritative moral oughts, things that we ought to do. And we experience these oughts pulling on us somehow, 
and that we know we have an obligation, a duty to do the right thing. The question is, what's the best explanation for this moral truth? If there is no God, it's, it's difficult to see how morality and love could be anything more than illusions, just subjective feelings nature selected for because they led to greater chances of survival and reproduction. Romantic love developed from an accidental chemical reaction that nature selected because it motivated us to reproduce and pass on our genes. Tonight I've argued that Christianity provides the best explanation for this objective moral truth we've discovered. Another thing we've discovered through experience is that we're all moral failures. We have a vision of what the moral ideal, moral perfection, is supposed to look like. I think we all envision that. But in our lives, our actual lives, both collectively and individually, we constantly fail to live up to that ideal. We're selfish, hateful, and we treat others unfairly quite often. The good news is that Christianity also explains the solution to our moral failings. If Christianity is true, and there's strong evidence to believe it is, then you were created by God for the purpose of enjoying loving relationships with Him and with others. That's the very meaning of life. If Christianity is true, love's not an illusion or an accident. It's actually the foundation of ultimate reality intrinsic to the relationships between the persons of the Trinity. The problem is that our moral failures have broken our relationship with God, and for many of us, broken our relationships with other people. Thankfully, though, God still loves us. That's why he orchestrated a way for your moral failures and mine to be forgiven and to be reconciled back to a right relationship with a God who made you and loves you. One of the members of the Trinity, God the Son, took on human nature and lived as one of us, giving us a perfect moral example of how humans should live. Jesus taught that we should love our enemies, care for the poor, treat others fairly, and forgive those who have hurt us. Though he was innocent, he died on a cross to pay the penalty that we deserve for our moral failings. Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Now, Jesus warned us not to trust in our own efforts to fix our relationship with God. It's impossible to earn your way back into a right relationship with God because our moral failures are just too great. He promised that instead of trusting what you yourself could do, if you would trust in Him and what He did for you on the cross, that you'd be forgiven of your moral failures, reconciled back to God, and welcomed into heaven to love God and love others for all eternity. I made that decision to trust in Christ, to become a Christian, 30 years ago now, and I encourage you to do so tonight. Thank you very much. Right into the Q&A session, we're going to start with a question to Dr. Sturba. It says, you stated that we should treat everyone's interests fairly. What about when interests conflict, and why should we care about other people's health? Yeah, I, I thought I kind of answered that in my presentation. So um, I will grant that interests conflict. Uh, Self-interests, altruistic interests, which are self-interests of other people. And my morality is compromise is the way of resolving that conflict. Uh, it favors high-ranking self-interested reasons over low-ranking altruistic reasons, high-ranking altruistic reasons over low-ranking uh, self-interested reasons. And then the second question was, well, why be moral ultimately, wasn't it, basically? Yeah, yeah. Why, why should you care about other people at all? Well, I mean, that was, uh, that was a worry for, for me. Uh, I, here's the account of morality. How am I going to, how am I going to convince the egoist particularly, but the altruist too, to endorse the account of morality? Well, then I, that was the reason for get, backing up from egoistic and altruistic reasons, employing a standard of non-question begging. The egoist should be wanting a non-question begging argument. He wants a good argument. It is a no, good argument is non-question begging. So I backed both the egoist, egoist and altruist up, and morality as compromise became the only non-question begging resolution. 
That shows that egoism is question begging. That shows that pure altruism is question begging. That's my justification for morality. Yeah, I would just say that that's the difficulty, right, with uh, doctors. One of the difficulties of doctor service positions is that how could how could fairness have any sort of authoritative uh, force over us? You know, even if we lay out or maybe we would agree collectively that fairness um, works or that fairness is, is is pragmatic, why would we have any obligation to do so? Um, it seems like one of the things we've discovered through our moral experiences is that morality has a, has a bit of authority over us. We feel this pull that we ought to do the right thing. And it seems difficult to explain uh, on, on Jim's uh, theory how fairness could ever generate that sort of obligation that we, we ought to do that, that why should we be fair? Or, or rational, if he wants to you know, punt it to rationality, you know, why should we be rational then? Okay. Uh, this question is directed to Dr. Johnson. You claim that God makes us aware of moral obligations through direct and indirect means. How then are we supposed to account for the fact that honest Christians disagree on a great many serious moral questions? Yeah, well, in whatever means God makes us aware of what's uh, good and bad, it's not infallible. So, for example, our conscience, that might be what you're thinking of, is, is our conscience, right? God gives us a conscience, in my understanding of things, and that helps us ascertain what's good and bad, right? But it's, it's not infallible, right? We make mistakes. Just like similarly, God gives us reason, God gives us our brains to help us figure things out via science and mathematics and, and all sorts of things. But our understanding isn't infallible. We make mistakes. We're finite creatures. So we make mistakes in all areas, right? Scientific areas, mathematical areas, moral areas. So God hasn't given us infallibility. Um, he's given us a conscience. And then even with his direct commands, right? I would say those are infallible, of course, because they're coming from a perfect God. But our interpretation of them can be infallible, or, or is infallible, right? Or is not infallible. I'm getting my ends mixed up. Our interpretation of God's commands can get messed up. So God's commands themselves are perfect, but our interpretation of those commands are imperfect. So that's, why I would, that's how I would explain how even Christians can disagree on what is good and bad, because... It involves interpretation, and that's where we can make mistakes when we interpret God's commands. Um, religious people and non-religious people have long known that religions offer different solutions, different pr proposals for what to do. And one of the things we've come to, because of these, this, this, this array of possible solutions, all coming from religion, all coming from what God says, is we then try to find a way of living together that we can support on reason alone. And this is the way our Constitution is actually devised. What could we know by reason alone? And, and then we know that, and then we kind of claim, well, if you've got something else that you think God says, well, if it conflicts with reason alone, we're not going to let you enforce it in society. The only thing you can enforce in society is what you can know on reason alone, and, and that's our standard. Uh, and that's the way we've been able to live together. Because religions have let us all, if we followed any particular religion religiously, it would lead us in different directions. And we, we wouldn't be able to live together. So we follow a standard of reason alone to set up our political societies. And we don't want religious reasons. We don't want people to vote just their religion. In the, in the, in they want, we want to be able, people to vote what reason alone can, tell, can, can justify. And we look at other people and we say, you have a different religion. I can't argue against your religion, but I'm asking you on reason alone, what, what, what would you, what can, can you give me a good argument for this? And we, then we argue on reason alone back and forth, put the religions aside in order to live together. That's a common morality. Okay. Dr. Sherman, for the answer to this question. Uh, the question says, while you make a good case for how we can get from rationality to moral objectivity, what ground rationality is 
fell as being a sufficient standard for producing moral duties that involve an assessment of the very altruistic and egoistic reasoning. If you're going to ask someone now to justify rationality, look, I'm a philosopher. Philosophers start with rationality and morality, and they argue to conclusions. If someone wants to say, I don't care about rationality, I can't give you an argument to be rational, because that would be a rational argument. So people who reject rationality are out, off, off the table. We don't. We don't deal with them. If one of our political candidates says, I don't, I'm, I don't accept rationality. I'm all for irrationality. What would we do? We couldn't work with that. Rationality is one of the bedrocks. If you now say, justify the bedrock, well, we're, we're be, be creatures that are capable of rationality. Uh, uh, other living animals, they're not. We have the ability to think rationally, and we have ability to think morally, and therefore we could be asked to think rationally and morally, and we can there, therefore justify our interactions on that on basis of rationality and morality. Animals, other animals cannot. We don't make those expectations of them. So we have this ability. The ultimate standard is rationality, and, and, and if you can't give, if you don't accept rationality, we're, you're not in the game. Yeah, so I think maybe this question is getting at something a little bit deeper. Um, I'm assuming that the question is getting at you know, where does rationality itself come from? Or how, where, how do you ground rationality uh, ontologically? So I think a lot of what Dr. Serb is discussing about is, is pragmatics. You know, practically, how do we get along um, as a society when we disagree about religious things or we disagree about moral things? Um, how do we get along or how do we devise our laws or just, you know, we reason them out. We, we, I think more with the, the deeper questions, the meta-ethical questions or metaphysical questions maybe even is that, you know, where does this rationality itself come from? Not what is pragmatic or what is useful, but where does rationality itself come from? And I think a good case can be made that um, rationality, like morality, is grounded in God. Um, so I think that similarly to morality, I think God is the best explanation for rational principles, rational thinking. I think an ontological foundation for rationality needs to be um, proposed as a theory. Okay, um, Dr. Johnson. In the Bible, God is willing to violate free will to achieve some greater ends. For example, Moses and Pharaoh. Would you contend that this was a case where God maximizes the good, whereas violating free will to stop the Holocaust would have not done so? Yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not convinced in that story that God is violating anybody's free will. Um, but regardless, um, are there any situations where God violates somebody's free will? Yeah, there might be. Um, if, I, if I gave the impression that I don't think God ever violates free will, that's not what I intended to communicate. I think that maybe there are situations where God does step in and violate free will. Um, but I think overall, when he was evaluating the potential timelines, possible worlds is how philosophers talk about it, but sometimes it's easier, especially after all of our Marvel movies, to think in terms of timelines. So you can envision God just you know, looking at various timelines and how if he would make a tweak here, that would change the timeline and then you'd be in a different timeline. All these tweaks, um, how stepping in or not stepping in would affect things and all the ripple effects that that could cause. I think when God was evaluating you know, those possible timelines, um, if he chose, for example, to force people all the time to act good, to be loving, then we would just be merely puppets and there wouldn't be any true good there. So the alternative timeline would be where there's free will, um, not that he wouldn't ever step in, but that he would want to um, constrain himself from stepping in and violating free will all the time so that true love true loving relationships could exist. 
from my perspective, you've got to take account of my argument that the all good, all powerful God is logically incompatible with all the horrendous evil in the world. That puts God off the picture here. Off the t now we can ask about human beings' free will. And what we all, we, we've already decided on this, we constrain human beings' free will. States do it all the time. We don't let people do anything they want. We're, the question is how much constraint should we place on, on humans' free will? And certain states do too much, certain states do too little, and, 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 and we have to find what is the justifiable constraint on free will. That's something we have to work out in human terms because God is off the table here if he's logically incompatible with all the horrendous evil in the world. You can't appeal to him to fix this problem. He's not there. Right. Uh, this question will start with uh, Dr. Turbo. It says, you said you visited with Wielenberg earlier this month. Did you get the chance to discuss your argument with him? And if so, what did he have to say? Uh, okay. Um, it turned out that he had an objection to my view, uh, which was like the objection that Peter Van Inwagen has raised. And I showed him that I have an answer to Peter Van Inwagen's objection. And he no longer has an image, any objection to my view. He's on my side. I don't, I don't have much to say in response to that. <laughs> I'll give Eric a call. <laughs> um, Eric and I have done a lot together. We wrote a book together and um, have had meals together. We brought him, I think I mentioned, we brought him here to, to UNL and we had, him and I had a debate. I introduced him to Runza's, you know, Valentino's, showed him all the Nebraska and Lincoln spots. So, no, I, I know him pretty well. So, yeah, I'd be interesting to see if he's, how and if he's changed his, his mind on this. Okay, uh, next question we'll begin with Dr. Johnson. Who says, why would God create people who choose evil? Could he not simply have only created those who really chose good? Yeah, and this is, um, this does go back to a possibility within Planiga's um, free will defense. He talked about the possibility, again, not that this is actual, but the possibility of something called trans-world depravity. You might be familiar with the idea of total depravity, um, just that human beings, as I mentioned in my last speech, we all fail morally. That's the idea of total depravity. We're totally depraved. But Plantinga brought up this idea of trans-world depravity, that there might be a possibility that in any uh, timeline that God would put me in, for example, that I would choose uh, some evil at some point. And it might be the case that any finite creature that God would create would be trans-world depraved, that eventually any finite creature would choose evil at least once. So if that is a possibility, then God wouldn't have that option on the table when he's choosing from possible timelines or possible worlds. So the idea of trans-world depravity can be useful in this conversation. Um, well, of course, again, I have to answer this thing hypothetically because I got an argument that there's no God. So if there were a God, what, what, what could we say about could God, or could, could there be a possibility of humans, what's with this? Could be possibility of humans always doing the right thing? Well, they would have to be quite different from us because we have conflicting interests. And those conflicting interests put us in, in, in conflict with each other. And sometimes people take unfair advantage of others in pursuing their interests. So any creatures like us would not be creatures that always did what is right. Now, you, you could imagine creatures that never have any conflicts of interest with anybody else. What, well, this is be really uh, uh, interesting kind of creatures. I don't even know exactly what they would be like. They, they, look, we find out that through conflict of interest and through immoralities, people do immoralities and we have to deal with it. We actually become more virtuous dealing with, it, dealing with immoralities of people. And people uh, uh, 
give up on their immoralities and become more virtuous. That's, we, we live through immorality and, and, and evil, some evil in the world. And that's how we, we grow. And so some pe people take evil to the extreme and we have problems. We have the Holocaust. But it's hard to think of creatures, any, nothing like us, who would always do what is right. We, we start off as little children. We have, we're selfish in many ways. We have some values of fear. There's conflict there. There's immorality, unfairness, and that's us. What kind of creatures would be that have no such conflict? This question will be for Dr. Sturba. It says, could an explanation of God's failure to intervene be explained because by intervening, moral evil prevention requirement A would be violated because it would violate the rights of people to choose to commit evil? Isn't God just letting it play out? Um, nobody has a right to always choose evil, on my view. Nobody has a right to choose, well, they could, horrendous evil, the consequences, they could, they, could, they could think, I want to do something horrendous evil. They could plan. What should happen is when they get to the consequences and, and impose it, that's when it hits other people, that's when they're stopped. Either stopped by us, who have an obligation to try to stop them. That's a universal obligation. As much as you can, stop the imposition of horrendous evil in the world. And, and then if there were a God, he should be, you know, the, 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 the preventer of last resort. That's the way the world should work if there were a God. It doesn't work that way. Uh, uh, it, uh, we don't do our job, and, 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 and God isn't there. So here we are. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think in this conversation what happens a lot is, you know, folks, and I, and I find myself slipping into this mindset as well, is, you know, we think that we've we got this timeline, right? We've got this um, history, human history. And we think, well, couldn't God, just, couldn't God just remove, you know, one horrendous evil from this timeline and keep everything else the same? Couldn't he just, you know, prevent the Holocaust and everything else stay the same? Loving relationships, everything else just stay the same, just, just prevent the Holocaust. And that's easy to surmise or imagine but we just don't know all the ripple effects that would, that would be caused potentially. I mean, just think of all the movies and novels that are put together about possible timelines and how somebody thinks, oh, well, if we just change this one thing, then everything would be better. But they change that one thing and it messes up so many other things. So what I'm proposing is that when God was evaluating these timelines, he knew you know, what was gonna cause what. And he, with his infinite knowledge, omniscience, understood all these ripple effects. So he knew that, for instance, it could be the case that if he stopped this horrendous evil, then it would actually lead to more horrendous evil or us making more evil decisions. And so when God is evaluating the possible timelines, I think, again, there's certain constraints because he's chosen not to violate, for the most part, our free will. And he's uh, another constraint is that he wants to minimize horrendous evil and maximize loving relationships. And when you have those sort of constraints that, again, he's self-imposing on himself. It's not that God is constrained by anything besides himself. He's imposing these constraints on himself. But I think it makes reasonable sense to think this is the best possible world, the best possible timeline that he chose, minimizing horrendous evil and maximizing loving relationships. Okay. Uh, this question is to Dr. Johnson. It says, uh, in your theory of morality, you focus a lot on morality being based on loving relationships, but how does this account for uh, natural evil? Yeah, that's a good question. So natural evil is going to be like hurricanes, tornadoes, so on and so forth. Why would God allow those sort of things? Um, similar, similarly, if you go back to this, you know, what is going to... Um, cause maybe greater loving relationships or more loving relationships with God. And it's just a, a fact of the matter that if you look at um, countries that are, or even individual lives, I can, I can give you several examples of people that have gone through very um, dire situations, it actually um, increases their loving relationships with other people. I mean, think of kind of what happened in our country after 9-11. Democrats and Republicans started hugging each other, you know? I mean, we got together and the, the, it increased our loving relationships in, in light of that tragedy. 
And so it might be the case that God allows natural evil um, because that maximizes our loving relationships with each other and with, and with him. And I would say, too, that there's a sense in which if Christianity is true, and I believe it is based on good reasons and evidence, there's a sense in which natural evil, uh, hurricanes, tornadoes, are also the result of our evil choices, that um, our sinfulness brought in to the world through Adam and Eve caused all the devastation that we experience because we live in a, a sin-cursed uh, universe Be because of our evil choices going all the way back to Adam and Eve, if Christianity is true. Um, so Adam and Eve, are they supposed to be there at the very beginning of humans, the first humans ever existed? The billions, 200,000 years ago? Um, and then they sin, and then what happened before Adam and Eve, there was all this natural evil on other living things, not human living things. We weren't the first human living things around. All that natural evil before Adam and Eve existed to create the sin that, caught, that was the explanation for the natural evil doesn't make sense what we know about the origin of life on the planet. Um, and the further thing here is um, we long in morality and thinking about morality, we've all realized that maximizing good consequences is not the, the best justification of morality. There's, there are constraints on means to, produce, to get to good consequences. You can't use unjust means to get to good consequences, even if there would be good consequences. There's one interesting example of, of uh, a, a, a doctor has five patients that need an organ. Guy comes in off the street, happens to have a healthy guy, we could carve him up and save five, five, five uh, patients. Greater good, five lives, one life. No good. Illegitimate means, preventing, allowing horrendous evil. If we could have allowed, if we could have prevented 9-11, we couldn't be justified in allowing it because of all the, ho the, the loving relations that happened after, because of 9-11. That would be illegitimate. We're supposed to prevent these horrendous evils. They're not legitimate means to good. And that would be true if there were God, and it's true for us. Okay. And then question is for Dr. Sturba. Says, theists act on morality and ethical behavior with the hope of making it to heaven. As an atheist, what is the drive or purpose behind having good morals if there's no life after death? Why do good deeds rather than poor ethical behavior matter if there is no eternal consequence? You want me to give a, a self-interested justification for being moral? I'm a, I'm a moral person. I'll give a moral justification, not a self-interested justification for being moral. If, I, if the only thing that moved me was a self-interested justification, I wouldn't be moral. Morality requires transcending self-interest. If that's your ground for, 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 for being moral, you think you're going to get rewarded in heaven? That's not good morality. That's not why you should be moral. I think there's, um, you know, there's a lot of pragmatic reasons to be moral, right? So even as somebody, for instance, like Dr. Serba, who doesn't believe um, that there's a God, I think there's a lot of pragmatic reasons to be moral. Um, just talking, going back to uh, the TV show Survivor, right? When groups uh, work together well, reciprocity, fairness, they take care of one another, they can achieve uh, tasks better than a group that doesn't work together well. So I think even, be, even if, there, if someone would believe that there is no God, there might be pragmatic reasons to, to do moral things. Um, so I would say, you know, even within my belief system of Christianity, I, there, there's more motivation for me to do the right thing than rewards in heaven. Um, not to belittle that or ignore that, but it seems to me my understanding of Christianity is, if, if it's true, and I believe it is, then a lot of our motivation for doing the right thing is we see um, that it has intrinsic value in and of itself and we have in our relationship with God that is one of the ways that we worship him and love him is by obeying him 
And we also see that his instructions, um, moral instructions on how we should act, are the best ways for us to be the best lovers possible. And when I mean lovers, lovers of God and lovers of others. So his instructions are, are a path for us. They tell us how to love others and love him the best. If God allows evil to be on earth because he understands the consequences of hell is giving us free will and experiencing true love, why is heaven experienced any differently where there is presumably no evil? Uh, say it again. I got stuck on the first part and I, I missed the last part. Yeah, the last part is basically if God allows um, evil on earth because of the free will and experiencing love and relationships, why is heaven different where there is presumably no evil? Mm. Yeah, so... And, and that's why it's better, I think it's better to talk in terms of timelines because the, the timeline that we're on includes uh, the next life, right? It includes an afterlife. If Christianity is true, and I believe it is, then we're not just talking about this life alone. This, the timeline um, includes this life and the next. And so if God's evaluating, right, these different potential, different possible timelines, you know, I think one of the key drivers would be um, who all is going to be in the afterlife and, and maximizing, right, um, loving relationships in the afterlife. People putting their faith in Christ and experiencing the afterlife with God and, and loving others in heaven, however you want to describe that. Um, God wanting to maximize that in this timeline. And it might be the case that this timeline uh, maximizes uh, the, the folks that um, experience that by putting their faith in Christ. Repeat the last part of the question again because I feel like I'm missing something out. It's basically why is there no evil in heaven? Oh, yeah. So it might be that you know, this timeline includes that ultimate uh, destination where there is no evil. But it could be, again, these are all possibilities, that we're speculating, it could be that the only way to get to that, um, for, for, for folks to, to get to that ultimate destination, is to go through this particular timeline that we're on. Um, there's more I could say, but I'm, I'm running out of time, so I'll turn over to, to Jim. Um, yeah, I, I actually wrote a paper before I put the book together. It was actually a possible chapter in the book, but, but uh, there was too much, too much, I was defending theism. My book initially started off defending theism and then became a critique of theism. The, the, the theistic reviewers couldn't get their head around that, that somebody would start off defending theism. One of the offense I had is, how, how are we gonna deal with the problem of hell, the afterlife? Um, how, you know, how, why, um, how could hell be justified? How could we not have freedom in the afterlife? Do we have freedom there? But if there's freedom, Freedom in this life, there, be, there, there is evil. We, we choose bad things. That's what freedom allows. But if, but if we're going to be in the afterlife and there's no evil, then there, there's no freedom too. How could we, because people will choose bad things. That's what we're like. So I got this idea that what you want in this life and the after, in the next life is constrained freedom. If God would constrain us to keep out horrendous evil, and does it in this life, this world would be quite an interesting place, good place to live in. And then, you know, in the afterlife, the same thing happens. So, so but of course, there's no constraint of, of evil in this life, but in the afterlife, so imagine, I, I was, imagine Hitler gets there. What is he going to, he's trying to organize national socialism and, and get it going in the afterlife. But, but what happens there is he can talk about it, but he can't implement horrendous evil because God is constraining the, 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 the action of horrendous evil. He would be frustrated. Hitler would be free to plan uh, horrendous evil, but he never could carry it out because the consequences, God was preventing the consequences in the afterlife. That's what God should do in this life. Hitler would, could have been storming about his ideas and they never would have got into place because God would be preventing the horrendous evil consequences. To fix up the problem of hell, you've got to have Freedom's still there, and you have to have a constraint in the afterlife. To fix up the problem of evil in this world, you've got to have uh, freedom and constraint so that the, the freedom doesn't get out of, out of control.
Okay. Uh, next question goes to Dr. Sturba. This one says, given the fact that there is no God, where did objective cross-species ethics come from? This form of ethics doesn't seem to be evolutionarily feasible. Um, you know, evolution or, or natural selection doesn't dictate everything we do. How many childless couples are there by choice? How many uh, uh, choose to uh, adopt children and take care of them? They're not genetically related to them. So evolution doesn't explain everything. What happens is we, we start out as evolutionary beings with not thinking much at all, and then we, our abilities to think get develop and our abilities to reason and, and, and moral ideals, we get to understand, discover moral ideals, and when then we start to implement them in practice and we create a world that works against evolutionary theory, practice. It's not all survival of the, of the fittest anymore because we use moral ideas that were sort of spin-offs from evolution to control evolutionary processes and make the world moral to some degree. That's a great achievement. That's what humans have been able to do, to counter evolution because of the, the development of their minds that was initially developed to, to just pass on their genes, but learn how to control the energetic world we're, we're involved in and, 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 and make it better. So, what's the question again? Uh, the question was basically about cross-species ethics. Oh. Well, we see, we look at other species. They're not moral agents, but they suffer. We look at what we do in factory farming. They're suffering. We, we can decide whether we're going to make them suffer or not. And we could argue we shouldn't make them suffer for the pleasures of eating a hamburger. We can have a veggie burger, and it could be almost as good. And then the animals wouldn't suffer. So we're considering animals taking into account they're not moral agents, we're moral agents, but we are doing things to them. And we could constrain what we're doing and make life better for them. And that's a moral requirement on us because that's something we can do. Yeah, so again, I think, you know, in a scenario where there is no God, I think this is very difficult to explain, you know, why, for instance, we are anything different or special than animals. We might just be a little bit further down the evolutionary path or a little bit further down our own evolutionary path than other animals. So it seems very difficult on a, a no God plus evolution uh, framework to, to make a case that we're anything special compared to other species. Um, you could take that one step further, right, on a atheistic understanding of things, what if we met life from another planet that was higher than us, right? Uh, a more higher form of life than we are. Why should, again, on an atheistic uh, understanding of things, why should they think us any more valuable or have moral worth or rights, moral rights, than we think cows have? So I think on this um, atheistic understanding of things, I think it's very, very difficult to explain um, the differences between the species and why some, as Jim is trying to say, some have moral rights and some don't. Um, because then, as I said, if we encountered higher forms of life from another planet, what would be wrong about them treating us as, as cows, using us for for meat. I would think we'd make, it would be a difficult case to make that they should treat us um, as special on this atheistic uh, understanding of things. Okay, and then we're bumping up against 9.30. This will be our last question. Uh, Dr. Johnson. Uh, it says that uh, you propose the Trinity and the loving relationships uh, as the basis of morality, but this seems odd because these relationships uh, don't seem well defined, or at least they don't seem to be elaborated on uh, in the Bible. I guess the question is, like, well, why is this the standard? Does it sound ambiguous? Okay. Yeah, well, John 17, I think, would be the best place to look. So when I was developing my theory, when I entered this conversation 10 plus years ago, 
um, I thought the answer was relatively easy, right? Well, God's, God's the source of morality. Um, all, all theists think that, right? That's the easy, and it was actually Eric Wielenberg, uh, the atheist that I've debated most over the years, that I think helped me see that the answer is not so simple. You've got to explain not, you can't just say that God's the source of morality, you've got to explain how that, how God is the source of morality. And so then within Christian philosophy, there's a lot of different theories about how God is the source of morality, his commands, his nature, the human nature he created us with, natural law theory, all that. But it seemed to me that as I dug into it myself, theology and philosophy, it seemed that I wanted to understand what it was about God that made him um, the moral standard or what it was about God's moral nature that made him perfectly loving and just. And it seems like the loving relationships, even though you're right, um, there isn't a lot about them described in Scripture. John 17, I think, is the greatest window we have into the Trinity. And so you read John 17 and you see these loving relationships. Um, and so it just made a lot of sense to me. And again, you know, building my theory, I'm doing it on the shoulders of giants. But it seemed that that there within God then was the source of love and justice, was the eternal relationships between those three divine members. Um, so it's not, some, sometimes people ask me, well, we're so different than God. We're so different than these Father, Son, and Spirit. How could anything we do ever resemble them? So we can kill each other. God can't, you know, the three divine persons can't kill each other but it's the loving or unloving aspects of our actions. So killing somebody is an unloving thing to do. That's why it doesn't resemble the love in the Trinity. Protecting an innocent person from being murdered is a loving thing to do. So it's the loving or unloving aspects of our actions that can resemble um, the love in the Trinity or not. Christianity develops through uh, the scriptures. I'm talking about the New Testament here. The earliest ones, their scriptures are, are uh, St. Paul's epistles. There's no discussion of a trinity there. Uh, you get to Mark, the first gospel. It's not even clear from Mark that, that Jesus is God. He's the Messiah at the very end. He's, he's special, uh, but not clearly even God. You get to Matthew, and, and Luke, and they have different uh, agendas. They have to explain, first of all, the, the thought that Jesus seemed to be saying that the, the second coming is right on the horizon. Don't, don't get married, don't, don't have children, because it's coming before, the, before your lives are over. There'll be the second coming. And then the second coming didn't come. So Christianity goes on, and we get to John 100 years later, uh, and, and he's got, he's already, the whole idea that this second coming is right soon, that's gone. And, and now the clear that Jesus is God is right on the surface of it. And still you don't have the Trinity yet. And then through the Father, is the, the doctrine of the Trinity develops. It, it, it wasn't there. It wasn't there in the early scriptures. It wasn't, it wasn't even there at, at, at the end of, uh, of the Gospels. And, and so it, it, it developed. And we, then we get a doctrine of the Trinity through councils. And it's still not very clear how you can have three persons in one nature and one God. It's still, you know, what's the explanation for this? And, and, and how three persons in one God could somehow have loving relations? You know, you look at what, uh, what Aquinas says on this is really difficult material. It doesn't quite make sense what, how to say this. It's such a mystery. So a whole, this Trinity thing is not there from the beginning. The divinity of Christ wasn't clearly there from the beginning. This is a continuing development of doctrine. And, and um, I don't why you want to pick some part of a development and say, that is going to be the standard of morality, the Trinity doctrine that got developed 200 years, 300 years after Christ's supposed death. Uh, that's not the way to go. All right, well, that concludes our debate. I want to uh, ask you to join me again in thanking our two speakers tonight.